Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Williams. Um, quickly, let's show off our teeth this morning. Find at least three people to smile at. Okay, go. Welcome everyone. Um, if you are visiting this morning, welcome again. Um, and visitors, we ask that you just do something real special here. Fill out a sheet of paper to the end of your pew, both ends hopefully. Just fill that out so we can have a record of your visit. Turn it in in the offering plate. It'll come your way in a few. But everyone open up your bulletins. Let me highlight a few things coming up. It's a good sound here in those bulletins opening. All right, now you can see that tonight we will continue on with Vacation Bible School. It will start at 6 o'clock. Um, now, where will we be meeting? Do we know? Here? In the gym. Okay, so we're going to have a fellowship night. Um, so we're asking that you bring finger foods, desserts, snacks, and such. Um, and we'll be in the uh, gym, and it will start at 6. And the kids are going to do a little presentation, tell you about their uh, day yesterday. So just make sure that you come and, and be a part of that. We had some visitors, and hopefully their parents will be here as well, and you can get to know them too. Um, this Wednesday, write this down, uh, it starts at 6 o'clock. We're going to have a July 4th kind of celebration fellowship. So the church is going to provide hot dogs and barbecue. So I would like for, for all of us to bring the rest of the stuff, so side dishes, desserts, drinks, and such. And so there'll be games, outdoor games going on outside. So just come bring the family. We'll have some fun together. Um, and if you look also uh, over here to the right top, there are two meetings going on after the service. So if you're going on the Texas mission trip, you're going to need to meet in the choir room. And then if you would like or are interested in going on a Nashville Christmas trip, you're going to meet up here in the front with Mike Duncan. All righty? And that is um, all that's written in the bulletin. But here's something that's not in the bulletin that you may not know about. So parents of little children, there's these cute little devotional books for kids. And they're all over wherever there's a table. We got a lot of those tables, and there should be one of these on it. So grab one for your kid to have a daily devotion, which is really neat. Okay, this is what it looks like. All righty, so now it's time for some Williams loving. Find that someone that you didn't get to smile at. Maybe they're across the way. And give them a big old hug and kiss on the cheek. Go for it. Today's uh, scripture reading is Romans 10, uh, 11 through 15. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they not believe in him in who, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Good morning again. You all have this puzzled look on your face. Uh, I didn't, uh, this is me from 12 years ago. 
I've come to warn you about the one you hired before. No, uh, it's good to see you all here this morning. Uh, good to see Todd Kurt back with us after uh, his mission uh, to Asia. Good to see him back. And then I saw somebody sneak in the choir this morning. Hey, Amanda, good to see you. And so uh, it's good to be here in the house of the Lord as we gather for worship this morning. And as we have, let us join our hearts and minds together in a word of prayer. Great God, we come to you this morning in this time of worship. Lord, lifting up our hearts to you. And God, praying that your Holy Spirit will speak to us. Remind us, Lord, of who we are, of who you call us to be. And give us strength, Lord, to be the people that you're calling us to be. Help us, Lord, to look to your Son, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and friend. It's a shining example of your amazing love for us and for all of humanity. Lord, be with us this morning as we worship. May our offerings of praise and adoration be pleasing to you. And may you speak to us through Holy Scripture and the words that we hear, that we may be changed more and more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Uh, first hymn this morning is hymn 204, Rock of Ages. Sing all four stanzas. Please stand as we sing. hymn this morning is hymn 543 <clears throat> when the roll is called up yonder sing all three stanzas
friend. Thank you, kids, and Rhonda, Marilyn. Uh, off tour hymn this morning is hymn 354, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Sing all three stanzas, the stanzas we sing.
the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for being with us here today, Lord. Lord, I, already our hearts are touched by these children. Lord, the smile and laughter they carry with them as they sing the songs. And Lord, forgive us sometimes if we dismiss them as just little children. But Lord, the words that come out of their mouths ring with so much truth. Lord, let us take an example from these children and leave here knowing that you love us. And that's all that matters. Your everlasting arms is all we need in this world and the one to follow. Lord, take the monies that's gathered here today, whatever sum it is, and keep doing kingdom work here at your house. This is your church, Lord, dear Williams. Keep doing kingdom work. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, amen. amen. <laughs>
The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the first letter of Paul to Timothy. It's 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll continue our series on what it means to be a church member. I must, must say this morning, though, this sermon may feel a little self-serving, but I promise it's, it comes from a place where it is not. As you're turning there, and I still hear pages turning, anytime our children stand in front of us and speak to us, I hope you know it's not just so we can awe and, and giggle and laugh, but it's that we may hear the words of Christ himself speaking to us. For sometimes we have to get our adult sensibilities out of the way. We have to get all those walls that we've built up over the years torn down and listen as children just tell us what Jesus has told us for so long. And so I'm tempted to just say, go in peace and listen to the children. But as this title says, don't you pay me to do something more than that. So we will be listening uh, here to Paul's words and then I'll spew a few remarks and we'll go on. 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. The saying is sure, whoever aspires to the office of bishop or elder desires a noble task. Now a bishop must be above reproach, married only once, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, an apt teacher, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. Easier said than done, isn't it, Paul? For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into the disgrace and the snare of the devil. These are the words of God for the people of God. May he add his blessings to them. Would you pray with me? Lord, this morning, again we pause to give you thanks for a day and a time of worship. And this morning, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters and colleagues and friends who stand in rooms like this one to proclaim the good news. I pray for those who meet under shade trees to preach, those who stand before altars in grand cathedrals, all of those, Lord, that you have called to the work a vocational ministry. I pray your blessing on them, Lord. When the times seem tough, when the days are joyous, may we all remember that you are with us. And so, Lord, now as we hear some words, God, may they be your words. And whatever words I may place in the way, Lord, may they quickly be forgotten. Be with us now, we pray, in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Just about a month ago, on a Sunday, Sunday, May 31st, I read a news story that I'm afraid is becoming too common. Phil Lineberger is a well-known, well-respected pastor in Sugarland, Texas. A pastor who had served his congregation for nearly 20 years. A pastor who had been a leader among Texas Baptists as he served as the vice president and the president of the Baptist General Convention of Texas, or the BGCT for short. He served them from 1988 to 1991. He was a pastor who, from all appearances, was a well-rounded, active, and beloved man. But I heard on May 31st that Phil took his own life. He had been on medical leave from his congregation since mid-March. And his son-in-law said in a press release, he said, Phil lost a battle with depression and took his own life. That same day, a Sunday, I saw Facebook posts, tweets, Instagram pictures of the Sunday morning worship at the First Baptist Church of Decatur, a suburb outside of Atlanta. Julie Pennington Russell, whom I met when I was in Waco, Texas, and she was the pastor of Calvary there, she had served as the pastor at First Baptist Decatur since 2007, the first woman to ever serve as pastor in the church's history, and the first woman in Baptist life to hold such a prominent pulpit. On that Sunday, Julie gave the benediction at the conclusion of the service for the last time. 
She had announced her resignation from the church on April 29th, and May 31st was her last Sunday. In her letter to the congregation, she said this, After months of prayer and contemplation, my husband Tim and I have discerned that for the sake of my own mental, physical, and spiritual health, I must step away from First Baptist Decatur. She didn't resign because she was called to another church. She didn't resign because she was offered a denominational position or a spot on a seminary faculty. She resigned because she had felt, in her words, that she had done her best to listen for God and to lead the congregation according to the Holy Spirit's guidance. However, she said, I'm afraid that today our church has become stuck and the sticking point for more than a few appears to be me and my leadership. She resigned without having something to fall back on. She resigned without a plan B. She resigned due to the pressures and stress that inevitably come with leading a congregation forward, with leading the people of God to make bold moves for the kingdom of God. And then the next day, Monday, June 1st, I was sitting downstairs watching television with Sally when I heard my phone buzz. I had a message from a friend of mine who serves a rather large, some might say successful, congregation in another state. And this is what his message said. Are you doing okay? It reminded me of a time when I was an intern at Shadescrest Baptist in Birmingham. I'd come back from spring break and the pastor there was telling me all that had happened, catching me up, all the progress we were making on our capital campaign, the upcoming plans for an international choir tour, the great things happening with our mission partners, all sorts of stuff. Down the list he went. And after he had gone down the list, I just simply looked at him and I said, Dennis, how are you doing? A few weeks later at our end of the semester uh, review, He said to me, you know, you did a lot. I watched you grow while you were here, but one of the most important things you did was ask how I was doing. And then this is what he said. He said, because when you enter ministry, few, if any, will ask you that. They will bring you your troubles. They will dump complaints in your lap. They will hold insanely high expectations of you and your family, but they will rarely, if ever, ask how you're doing, how you're really doing. So I thought about that as my friend from out of state was texting me the other night, and it became pretty pretty clear to me that even though his church seemed to be doing well, that even though he was such a highly respected pastor and leader, the stress seemed to be getting to him because this is what he said to me. He said, I'm always thinking of a plan B. I just about quit three times in the last two weeks. I had this conversation with him with the news of Phil's suicide and Julie's resignation still on my heart and mind. And if I'm completely honest with you, it's not the first conversation I've had. And if I'm really, really honest with you, if I can just talk to you for a minute, I've been on both sides of that conversation. I've had friends and colleagues have the same conversation over and over. And can I really tell you something without sounding too much like I'm complaining? You see, one of the hardest things for us clergy folks to do is to advocate for ourselves. One of the hardest things we can do is say, hang on, I I need some help. I need a break. I need some time. It's hard for us to admit, I don't know what to do. There's no book on this. I didn't take a class on this. It's hard for us to admit when we don't know what we're doing. It's hard to ask for help. It's hard to speak up when we feel we've been stretched too thought far spread too thin, or held to ridiculous standards of availability and self-sacrifice. So can I just talk to you for a few minutes? Is that all right? We, I mean, this is what we're talking about as church members, right? Now, I know some of you, some of you won't hear what I'm saying, and that's okay. Some of you will just write it off as the whining of a young pastor, and maybe that's what it is. But I think, I think you all need to hear what I have to say. What too many of us in ministry, most of us in ministry, it seems these days, have to say, but we're afraid to say it. And I want you to listen. To listen to these, these words. They're statistics, but they're words from numerous surveys of thousands of pastors across the theological and denominational spectrum of North America. This country. Every month, 1,500 pastors Leave the ministry for good. Did you hear what I just said? Every month, 1,500 pastors leave the ministry for good due to burnout 
or contention in their congregations. They don't take a leave of absence. They don't leave another, for another church. They don't leave for another ministry position. They leave vocational ministry for good. They don't come back every month. 50% of pastors' marriages end in divorce. Now, while that sounds like a familiar statistic among the non-ordained, keep in mind these are ministers. These are pastors. And many of them cite the reason for their marriage ending is not money, is not spousal dispute, it's the stress and demands of ministry. I know that's true because 80% of pastors and 84% of their spouses are discouraged by ministry. And 80% of pastors report that congregational ministry and its demands have adversely affected their families. Eighty percent, eight out of ten pastors, however you want to look at that, have said being a pastor has adversely affected their family. That's a number too big to ignore. At least 40 pastors, 40 percent of pastors, have seriously considered leaving the ministry in the last three months. With schedules that are more often bent than just flexible, pastors find the fixed boundaries of a so-called normal job tempting. The thought of clocking out and leaving it all in the office until tomorrow is something many pastors dream about. And this seems to be especially true when I consider this statistic, one I found particularly telling when it comes to the expectations of those of us in pastoral ministry. Pastors who work fewer, less than 55 hours a week, are 35% more likely to be fired. Did you hear what I just said? Pastors who work less than 55 hours a week are more likely to be asked to resign or fired. That means if a pastor makes time for himself, for herself, time for rest, time for their families, that that pastor is more likely to lose his or her job than a pastor who snubs at the Sabbath, who ignores their family, disregards their health, and doesn't care about their overall physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. They are more likely to keep their job. Only one out of every 20 pastors makes it to retirement. One out of 20, I think that's a bit high. Half of pastors feel so discouraged and unable to meet the unrealistic demands of their congregation that they would leave their job in ministry if they could, but they have no other way of making a living. Seeing as how they've given all of their life to ministry, their education, and their training. One in four pastors has been forced out or fired from a ministry position at least once. And 90%, 9 out of 10 pastors, say they feel inadequately trained to cope with the stress and demands of their job. Most of them have an undergraduate education and an extensive graduate education in religion, theology, ministry, divinity, what have you, and they still feel this way. I have a hunch that it's not the training. Because I've crammed a lot in my 94-hour master's degree. I suspect it's rather the insurmountable expectations that's placed upon so many clergy. 45% of pastors say they've experienced depression or burnout to the point of needing to take a leave of absence, but I doubt many of them do, and I doubt many of their congregations would let them. 70% of pastors say they do not have one close friend. That one hurts. Not one friend. Another 70% say they have lower self-esteem now than when they entered the ministry. And according to denominational health insurance agencies, uh, medical costs for clergy are higher than any other professional group, period. Once upon a time, it was the other way around. Did you know that? Once upon a time, clergy were considered the happiest of the vocations. Now, their medical costs are highest as they deal with stress-related health issues such as high blood pressure, obesity, insomnia, and depression. And one of the most telling statistics for me, and it's the last one I'm going to give you if you've taken notes, one of the most telling statistics for me comes from the Schaefer Institute. They interviewed 1,050 pastors, and every single one of them, there was no exception, every single one of them said they had a close friend from seminary who has quit ministry because of burnout, conflict in their church, or a moral failure. I can tell you just off the top of my head, five of my friends from seminary. And one of them left the faith altogether. Now, I know what some of you will say. Chris, my job is hard. 
My job is hard too. My job comes with a lot of stress. And you're right, I don't doubt that at all. I don't doubt for one second that you have a lot on your plate. But here's where I think things are different. Too many pastors are forced to resign. Too many are fired. Too many are, are, are victims of depression and take their own lives because their vocation is completely intertwined with their faith. Their job is completely wrapped up in their spiritual lives and the very way they identify as a child of God. And when they do their job, when they seek to lead others in the way of Christ, when they strive for justice, when they make bold steps towards revealing the inbreaking kingdom of God, and then are faced with constant criticism, the downright hateful actions of those who wish to see them removed, the ignorance of those who wish to carry on their ways of life as if the call to come and follow Jesus is just a nice suggestion, is it any wonder, any wonder that so many of them won out? When pastors pray, study, and wrestle with a text for hours, only to be told that they are wrong by someone whose reflections are only a few minutes old. When a pastor gives every waking hour to the ministry and work of the church, only to be told she forgot to visit someone's great aunt in the hospital in the next county over. When a pastor weeps and prays over the pains and trials of a church member who is going through hell, only to be chastised, because they forgot to smile at someone in the grocery store last Tuesday. When a so-called church member, a supposed follower of Christ, comes in to their pastor's office and threatens her to stop preaching about this or that, or they're going to make her life hell. When a pastor rejoices in the news of another giving her life to Christ, only to be deflated by complaints about the length of the service, the order of worship, the temperature in the sanctuary, when they poured themselves out spiritually, only to be told uh, the upstairs toilet is clogged. There's a committee waiting on you to show up. And they see that same person standing in the hallway who always has something to say, waiting to tell them a dozen things they did wrong this week. Is it really any wonder so many give up. Is it really any wonder? So many of us think about walking away several times a month, a week, a day. When we are called by God to lead, when we give of ourselves to others, folks who might otherwise be total strangers to us, when we pour our hearts and souls out and preach what the Lord has placed on our hearts, and yet it's ignored, our words are dismissed as the irrational opinions of somebody who doesn't know any better. They'll just grow out of it. And when our ministry is seen as easy living, when people tell jokes, but really they mean, Yo, you only work one day a week. Is it really any wonder so few of us actually make it to retirement? Now, I really hope what you, you hear me saying is not complaining or even confession, because this is things I've heard from others. And these are words I've read. I want you to know what those of us in ministry go through. I want you to know that ministry isn't just some cushy job that only requires working a couple of days a week, visiting with folks and eating fried chicken. I don't know where that started. I want you to know that as your pastor, as any pastor, as any minister and leader in this church can tell you, we can't do it all. You can't pay a minister enough to add a 25th hour to the day. You can't pressure them enough until they split into two people and get everything they need to get done, done. That means that ministry is not just the job of the people who draw the check. That ministry isn't just my job, and it isn't just my vocation. It's yours, too. That ministry is your job, too. That as a church member, it's your job too, with me, with Nikki, with Sean, with those of us who lead in those areas. We're all in this together. That doesn't mean that your part is to just pay for stuff or pay salaries to, to make requests, to sit back and hope things go your way. That means we are all in the dirty, hands-on business of kingdom work together. That means we all have to work together, even when we don't agree. And that's maybe the hard thing. 
We all have to work together, even when we think it's somebody else's job, even when we think somebody else ought to be paid to do this, even when the work is hard. We all are called to work in the kingdom together. And that's what it means to be a church member. That's the difference between being a member of the body of Christ and a mere spectator. That's the difference between following Jesus and just giving lip service to religion. That's what it means to be a church member, to join in in the work of love, to follow the ever forward call of Christ, to trust in the God who calls some out to be shepherds, but calls us all to do the work, to listen for the voice of the Spirit even in your own heart. Because who knows? Maybe God's calling you out of the flock, out of the fold to that hard work of ministry. I'm sure the numbers I've given you this morning have encouraged you. May we all listen for the voice of Christ. May we all join in in the uniting work of God's kingdom. May we all know right now and live out with our lives what it means to be a part of the body of Christ, what it means to be church members. All of us. Each and every one of us, not just those of us who have been ordained or called clergy or have the three little letters REV in front of our names. May we all be called. May we all listen to that calling from Christ and join in and do the work of God's kingdom together. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear, Lord. Ears to hear you calling us to the work. Give us strength. Strengthen our hands and our feet, Lord, to join in the work together. To not simply see a distinction, those who are ministers and those who are not. But help us, Lord, to know that we are all called to the ministry. Help us, Lord, to understand that Baptist distinctive that has defined us for so long, that we are all believer priests joined in the work of the kingdom together. So, Lord, speak to us. Be with us, God, we pray. and Stir within our hearts. And help us, Lord, to make whatever move we need to make this morning. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning will be the first and second stanzas of hymn 385 near the cross. Please stand as we sing. First and second stanzas.
I'll tell you what, when you shave your face off, your nose starts running and your eyes water. I don't know what. Um, let me encourage you to be back here tonight at 6 in the CMC in the gym as our kids from Bible school and all those who are here just show us, again, more of the love of Jesus and be here to show it back to them. I mean, there's food. So come on, bring some food with you and let us all join in together in the love and the work that Christ is doing right here in our midst and especially through our kids. And as we go out this day, may you hear the Spirit of Christ call you, call you into the work. And may you answer that call with willing hands, feet, hearts, and minds. Let us pray. Lord, go with us now from this place. Guide our steps, guide our lives. Strengthen us, Lord, we pray, by your Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ, amen.